thanks for listening to CCC. Uh, we're starting back up our Community Connections program, and uh, we're here with DJ Guts and DJ Steele, and I'm Yenny. So thanks for listening to CKMS 102.7 FM Radio Waterloo. Uh, here during these COVID times, uh, the station is trying to do its thing to stay involved with the community. And uh, for us as people, everybody is sort of doing their thing, and this is what we do. And so Rob has been with the station, DJ Seal has been with the station for many years. And I just mentioned earlier, I know DJ Guts is fairly new on board now, but uh, uh, I know there's uh, got a, a lot oh, of knowledge. I, I've, I've heard of the great uh, DJ Steele. Right. So thanks for coming on the show. And uh, yeah, talk to well, us. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I, I, I can't remember the exact year. I think it was... 2008 or 2009 when i uh, joined with ckms and at that time it was just before it left the uh, bauer warehouse bauer warehouse i think it was called and so uh, i just wanted to start as a community member programming on it we uh, an earlier band that i was in uh, called cyanide kiss uh, went on it a few times with Arda O'Kell's uh, program. He had a show. Arda O'Kell started with CKMS, and then he went and started uh, as um, a talk show host on The Score, and then was with the WWE for a while. As uh, He changed his name. He wasn't Arda O'Kell in the WWE. He was Kevin something or other, uh, <clears throat> just an interviewing uh personality and then um went back to the score and I, i'm not sure exactly what he's with now but we were on his show a couple times which is what got me into it and then uh and then i got in probably the year it was going through the troubles and then it left the station and then moved to all the different locations with it so that's how i had kind of a a, a unique perspective of all the different locations that the station had been through and talked with a bunch of people from each of the different locations and was able to get video from each of the different uh, different locations and then put together that uh, documentary. Oh, I know uh, that guy you were talking about. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, about the station there. Yeah. That's so. sweet. And you're actually who trained me. When I first started my show, I met you and I believe Adam and you guys were the ones that taught me how to do radio. Oh yeah. Nice. I, I Up in, we, uh, that was at, in Waterloo. Yeah. Or um, uh, on King street there by central. Okay. Yeah. About, uh, right by the subway or whatever, Mr. Sub or. Right. Yeah. That's nice. it. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, our show, me the yeah. Our show kind of doubled as, uh, our show and the training time. So whenever new people mm -hmm. started, we we did a whole bunch of training back then. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was awesome. I, I wonder yeah. about back in the early days of DJ Steel, Rob McKenna. Um, so with music, what what was your first experiences with creating music, or even just you know when you realized maybe music was something that you liked? Um, well. Interestingly enough, so with all the changes and things that are going on right now because of COVID, I'm finding myself uh, with where I work, my day work, having to teach uh, get, uh, intro to guitar. And uh, so it, I was thinking a lot about way back when I was uh, in, in high school and took intro to guitar. That was probably my first introduction to music. And uh, I took it with a friend of mine and we would just like it was a lot of practice time where you would sit and practice and, and pl learn songs and things like that. And I remember the the one day the teacher brought in an electric guitar and he had it up uh, uh, hooked up with um, just like a drum machine that he would put on on the computer and you could play with the drum machine. And I, I, again, it was intro to guitar, but he said, does anyone want to come up and in, in front of the class and try an electric guitar? And nobody wanted to, but I thought, yeah, what the heck, I'll try it. So I went up. You can handle and the power. It, yeah, right. <laughs> it, it, given the opportunity, I got to try it out. So oh. 
I went up and it was just so much fun. Like he had a little bit of distortion or overdrive or something on it. And I didn't know what I was doing, but it, it exactly like what you said, it, it was just so much power. Like you, you would just play that and it was so loud and everything. And, and uh, mm-hmm. at the time, I didn't even really think of how it sounded. I just couldn't believe that that was me like strumming along here and everyone was forced to listen because I was so loud in the classroom. So uh, oh. that was probably the start of uh, electric you took that big E and- chord and it's like the vibrations go through your body and you become the str- you're, you're almost strumming with the uh, your body is going with the vibes of the guitar. You are yeah. you are a part of that. You become one instrument almost. It, it it's something like that. Like so many artists will say that they just absolutely love performing live, and I think it's something to do with that. Like people will even ask, like, "Well, we'll play a show or whatever," and they say, "Well, what? Like, if you just love music so much, why don't you just create it? Why do you have to perform it in front of people?" Or like, why don't you just jam in, in your basement and play it? Uh, and yeah, I don't know what it is, but it's something with being in front of people and there's like a little bit of nerves and a, a little bit of uh, like that connection that maybe sometimes you do something and it, it connects with people. And, and I, I don't know exactly, I can't put my finger on exactly what it is, but just something about that is is really uh, intriguing, I think, to a lot of people, and that's why they do it. So, when was the first time you got? To, what was your first instrument? What was your first guitar? Um, I think I still have it, probably hanging somewhere back there. Um, I don't know <laughs> if it can be seen. Uh, no, I think it's somewhere in the corner. Okay. But uh, it was just. Oh, there goes my. It was just a a cheap guitar, uh, kind of like a Strat imitation, a Sunburst Strat imitation that I got. And uh, I think it was after I took the guitar class and liked it so much, uh, my parents got me that for Christmas the one year. Nice. Nice. Best Christmas present ever. Yeah. Yeah. When was your first time where you were experiencing with recording some of your jams? What What got you into the the production process of things okay so um i i uh after i played guitar a little bit i it's weird because i i there are different musicians will say that they write differently and if you look at some musicians uh they have a harder time writing and they really work at it uh, a lot and um like there are some great musicians who only have like one album and, but they put so much work into that one album and it's amazing. And then there's other musicians who just write like they're prolific writers and they just are writing music all the time. And right away I felt, uh, I felt like a lot of the, a a lot of music was coming to me and and I wasn't super great, but I, I was getting these ideas. And so I was playing a whole bunch. And I was worried, I remember being worried that I would not be able to record it and get these ideas down because it's easy to forget. You play out a riff and it's easy to forget how to um, how to play it or the strumming or the rhythm or whatever. And um, so I would I would practice these couple songs that I wrote uh, uh, quite a bit. And then when I when I was done high school, uh, my brother start ended up buying a drum kit and together we started putting together a whole little home recording studio but it ran through like a tape player with a computer attached and cool uh it was it was the worst home recording studio ever Uh, but it (laughs) it worked yeah but it worked like it got some ideas down onto a tape cassette and then we could remember these ideas and then uh, a couple friends of mine, uh, DJ uh, Adrock and another friend of mine, um, they all wanted to be a part of a band too. So we, we started playing in Hamilton a whole bunch. And then uh, a few people at, um, I can't remember what the recording studio is now, 
but they heard like they just heard us play like because they were always at this venue called the underground and they heard us play and then they asked if we wanted to record with them and so uh and pay them obviously but they asked us if we wanted to record with them mm -hmm. so uh we together we put together the money and went in and recorded and their stuff was so unbelievable. Like they had like super professional stuff. And uh, the the guy Robin Abe um, was showing me and teaching me all through it. And so after that, the the whole weekend, I don't know, ended up costing us like three thousand dollars or something like that. And so in the future, I I thought. Like That's instead of spending that on recording one album, like maybe I could slowly over time put together uh, like money and technology to to build that so that we can get better recording ourselves and just work, work uh, like do what we can for this album. And then for the next album, when, if we have a little bit more money, we'll put that into a little bit more tech and then build up kind of this library so like kind of the things that you see behind me i didn't yeah, get all at once these are there. years and years of collecting so so you kind of took the the reins you said i'm gonna i'm gonna control my destiny and i'm gonna make sure that i have the i have the comfortable position to to expand on your own terms basically yeah the the so the first album which for cyanide kiss it's definitely the best sounding album because it was a professional recording studio. Uh, the the second one, it sounds all right for what it is, which is completely learning how to record everything. Like a, it, it definitely sounds like we started strong and then dropped a level, but uh, then each one after it's like progressing from that one with learning how to record and mix and master and all these different parts that, uh, and, and even just learning it. Like I remember watching uh, a YouTube video with mastering and the guy was saying, okay, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna apply this compression to the overall uh, sound here. And he would he would apply the compression and he's like, see how much better that sounds? And I'd be think, listening, thinking, I don't, I don't hear anything different. <laughs> so, Right. You, you almost have to tune your ears for what exactly what it's doing, because uh, like the mastering stage is so uh, it, you're not you're almost not listening to the overall sound, um, mm -hmm. but you're listening to when, when they say the shape of each of the instruments. Uh, like if you listen to a track, you just hear the overall sound of it. And sometimes if you hear a muddy track, You'll you'll kind of hear that the bass blends in with the organ and different things like that, and it may still sound great that way. But if you listen to a real uh, professional, like a, a lot of the top uh, top twenty or top thirty uh, hits of the year, Rolling Stones hits, uh, if you listen to it, you can really hear. Oh, that's the guitar, and that's the bass, and they have this instrument. Right. So there's a lot of shape around. Uh, the instruments and it's it's tricky to do uh, which is why even those mastering people get paid the big bucks to do these big albums it's a big job and some of that stuff comes back to some influences too maybe maybe the shapes of the instruments that you were talking about there maybe the ideas that you have maybe it's shaped by some of your own influences from growing up or maybe at the time so what are some of the musicians and what are some of the other musical acts that kind of inspired you that shaped all that? I think uh, initially I was a huge fan of the Smashing Pumpkins and people used to say a lot that Cyanide Kiss sounded like the Smashing Pumpkins, like the, okay. or that we were uh, trying to sound like the Smashing Pumpkins. I don't know if we were nowhere near on that level, but, um, but what I, what, really kind of opened me up musically was DJing at uh, CKMS because then all that new music coming in and uh, DJing with with uh, Adam or DJ Adrock, he has got like a completely different, not completely different, but uh, a different taste in 
alternative uh, rock music than I do. And so we would go back and forth a lot on the show with with songs that we would play and his tastes were were very different i i always thought like you you are just we would have battles and whoever played better songs uh won that week and i would always just think you you i'm going to destroy you based upon the songs that you're playing but different people connect <laughs> with different types of music and so he, a lot of the times he would win. So and, and so people connected with that different type of music. And it, it really opened my eyes to a lot of different Canadian music, especially. And so it made me appreciate all these different Canadian bands. And I got into a lot more different types of music. OK. And like uh, the, the, the stuff that you're working on now, because I'm fairly new to your bands, like Robot Apocalypse, Apocalypse and All Weather Haulage. I was just listening to to the show, and it's amazing. Like, I want a t-shirt, definitely. Uh, <laughs> like, I just can't believe what you created. It's amazing. Like, this is, congratulations. So you have some amazing collaborations, too, on the one, there's violinist, right? And so what have you accomplished? Like, Smashing Pumpkins to where you're at now, that's, uh, like it's like a new universe of, of growth and experience. Yeah. So a lot of a, a lot of the collaborators, like uh, once I started programming and appreciating all these other bands, um, and Cyanide Kiss had broken up. We got the idea for this. Uh, uh, we were making an audio comic for CKMS, and at the we uh, had a grant from the city of Waterloo and the city of Kitchener. And we had some money left over. And so we thought maybe in the second season, we'll uh, record some of our own uh, music and then get collaborators to, uh, to collaborate <laughs> upon those songs with us. And maybe we could, like if we could get somebody like we, we were uh, Hot Hot Heat fans as well. And so we thought if we could get someone like Steve Bay's to record with us that would be like unbelievable he, he's toured all over the world as like a, a famous canadian uh uh musician and so um we approached him and we like we've done an interview with him and we've seen a bunch of his bands play and he was like yeah sure i'll do it and so he recorded with us and then uh we were all like super excited about that and we thought well maybe let's ask the one of the guys at 5440 and the thing is we thought well we'll ask them and if they say no well then we're no worse off than before mm -hmm. we'll just ask somebody else mm -hmm. and more and more people started saying yeah yeah sure we'll we'll do that and so it just kept building and then we put together i think four tracks uh four or five tracks for that uh season of um the electrifying adventures of that's right oh yeah Jeffy you were in Jeff. it. yes there is there is and it almost looks uh exactly how i uh my attire is now the character uh, in in the the series there <laughs> for the people out there i believe that's on radiowaterloo.ca if you search in there up on the search bar yeah. you should be able to pull that up from a couple of years that, that was already four or five years ago maybe yeah, I think the first season um, we started recording in 2014 and maybe released it. No, I think we did it in 2015. Mm -hmm. And then the second season in maybe 2017. I could be wrong, but something like that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Hi. Yeah, yeah I that was pretty cool. Original content produced by someone at CKMS. It's pretty unique stuff. Um, and uh, I had suggested, I think that there are some talk about there being some radio plays or something like that in the future on CKMS. And it'd be cool to bring out, dust off the old Electrifying Adventure series, um, especially considering that. So basically, that's just the early days of Robot Apocalypse. Yeah, that's what got it going. And then we just started, like, speaking of influences, we just started thinking, these are the bands that we like. Let's ask them if they'll collaborate with us and so like there are ones that don't reply because they're so huge that they probably get so many messages like that mm -hmm. and they just uh, brush it off but 
with 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 all the recording technology now and at home recording and social media and stuff like that a lot of these bands are so much more approachable and, and uh it, it's unbelievable the kind of the collaborations that they'll do especially when they know that the project will come together because we uh interviewed them before for radio and things like that so we have this uh past relationship with them so Speaking of the studio and the gear, I don't know if you're able to. I don't know if you're able to show us uh, right now. But if you could, though, take us through some of the things, uh, at least uh, verbally. What are what are what's some of the gear that you got? What what's some of the technology that you're speaking of here? Um. So, for for recording the what we what I started out recording on, I can probably grab it sure yeah it gives more time for people to look at all the cool stuff i like the custom guitar there and the the background oh yeah that blue very sharp it looks like it could stab somebody if you're not looking around properly do you bring that yep. to live gigs and did someone get did someone ever walk into that and poke an eye out no i i used to play with that one for a while and um uh in cyanide kiss and it it but it's just it's such a harsh sounding guitar it's it's okay. a japanese Hondo guitar and it's I, I it's so twangy when when you play it that uh but it looks so cool that right. I even had someone from another band offer me 400 bucks on the spot to buy it off me just because wow. it looks so cool right uh but I I didn't want to sell it so um yeah, yeah that one right there that one I used for cyanide kiss and then eventually um I have like a, a Paul Stanley Kiss guitar that uh, I I thought it was kind of funny it, that it was a Kiss guitar and then I would use it for Cyanide Kiss. So okay. uh, that is the main one that I use for Cyanide <laughs> Kiss because it was like super deep uh, and super low tone. So um, we had a, a keyboardist doing all the lead and then I would uh, use that and kind of me and uh, Adam would be the bass and we'd kind of go to get fit together and let the keys do the lead in that project. The, uh, the custom guitar there is one that I built uh, for Robot Apocalypse. That one, it's got two separate pickups and two separate outputs. So the one, I, I probably should try and patent this or something but i i thought it was pretty cool um so when cyanide kiss broke up uh it broke up because adam had lots going on so he left and so i thought well how are we gonna have bass uh if he's gone and, and the three of us are still playing so uh in that guitar i built it so that the top two or the top pickup only picks up the top three strings and it sends it through one output, which I then whammy down a full octave so that it sounds like a bass. And then the bottom pickup picks up all of the strings and sends it out a different uh, pick or output. And then I run that through a guitar okay. effects pedal. And then that keeps it at the regular octave so that I have a, a bass playing with the guitar all in the one instrument. Interesting. Hey, that, that's pretty cool. Maybe you should look into paying into that for a patent yeah like i i, I don't know what's involved but all these yeah. like white stripes then they got a bass Something, and yeah. a, a guitar all in one right there so, so it's kind of yeah. like a stratocaster-esque I, I can see the headstock isn't the the trademark fender but i, I can tell it has that uh when you mention whammy down you, you're able to like whammy bar it down uh hack no. it kind of or or is there an effect that you could use for that yeah, there's a, a whammy pedal okay. that um, you can whammy the whole thing down a full step. Okay. And uh, or you can whammy it down more, but um, yeah, you can whammy it down a full step. And that's what I do so that it's a, a full octave lower than what I'm actually playing. And so that the two mix perfectly. Uh, I also do some weird things where uh, I think uh, Rage Against the Machine used to use a whammy pedal a lot with their bass uh, just to change notes and things like that. So I, I, I'm i not as good as, as that, but I just whammy it up an octave and bend the notes almost like you would with a whammy bar. Mm -hmm, sure. 
So you that's and so you cool. even got some cool concert posters behind it. So that's kind of almost like uh, <clears throat> not a shrine, but definitely a uh, that is a cool little little nook for uh, for collecting <laughs> stuff. As a as a collector too, I I, I definitely appreciate that. Yeah, so a lot of them are, um, I'm just looking. Oh, I even have down in the corner, it's, I don't know if you can see it. Nah, not really. It's down below the acoustic guitar. There is the uh, CKMS, what, what was that one? Oh, that was oh, the I see a, I see a flower the, in there. Yeah, it was the uh, CKMS New Frequency Party at okay. the Boathouse cool and uh oh, oh, wow. a bunch of them the one right above the acoustic guitar there oh, i'm right in the way is uh as part of the mono a mono show we held at imbibe uh the, or imbibe or it's not there anymore it was right in front of the in kitchener the um uh the museum uh paul jago from the Gadarvas. Uh, came out and then we at, back then we were sponsored and we had a, a brewery make a special mono a mono uh, beer and then we had it that okay. night cool. uh, and then a bunch hmm. of the other ones are just they're all I guess they're all kind of like a shrine now because a lot of them are from Starlight uh, mm -hmm. which I think just closed down uh, during the COVID uh, the whole COVID stuff some of them are from Hamilton and, and the area yeah I usually, when I'm at the show, the best place, and I'm probably giving this away and now people will go and do this. The best place is you go into the show before the band start, you go straight to the washroom and they don't like you taking down future right. uh, show posters, but they don't mind if you take down the show poster for that night because the future ones are advertisement uh, for the people who are there. But nobody goes into the washroom and grabs the show poster. So that's what I do. I go right to the washroom and check if there's okay. that night show poster. That's okay. Maybe people are going to end up uh, taking some of that into their own. Uh, but so uh, it almost continues on. You can tell behind you there's uh, some amplifiers there. Maybe maybe depending on what you're recording. Um, I imagine using them all at once is, is probably not a good idea. But you probably uh, could. But... I'm imagining each one has its own unique sound and, and maybe whatever you're jamming, you, you'll go with one. What's that, uh, what, what's that all about? The, the, um, yeah, for, for band practice, we usually use all of them. Um, the, the Dean Markley is a, a two amp, So it, it does have a pretty thick sound. Uh, but lately I've been using this, uh, Cordovox over here that, it, it's actually when I was filming the ro uh, the uh, Radio Waterloo documentary, I went to the uh, location on Waterloo Street, uh, the one that was like on the second floor of that place. Uh, and um, when, when I was there, there was a guy throwing out this amp and he said, oh, yeah, it works and everything. If you want it, just take it. So I pulled my car up and I grabbed that amp mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> right away when we got it uh, back to our, our practice space wasn't here. It was at my brother's place. Then uh, we blew it. it. We blew some of the, uh, the amplification oh, in boy. it right away. And so <laughs> then we had this amp head and then recently I had it sitting in my garage for so long. I thought, I'm going to, I'm going to see if I can wire this thing up and put it together and uh, get something working again. And the amp head has kind of got, um, I don't know, one, two, three, four inputs to it. So I use it as I can connect the bass, I can connect the guitar, I can connect my analog synth stuff that I've got over there. Interesting. And uh, I use that one as my amp. And then the bottom one there is a bass amp that we sometimes run. My brother built a hybrid uh, electric drum kit mixed with a, a regular sounding drum kit. And so he runs the bass drum through that. And then uh, we've got the extra Dean Markley for uh, keyboards or vocals now. So Cool. So, uh, and if you have some That's other nice. equipment, uh, I don't know, you're, you're, earlier you said uh, you were going to pull out one of your earlier oh, yeah. pieces of equipment there. 
Um, just so that our, our viewers and listeners, okay, cool. So that's something, so basically that you, is that something you could put a cassette into or is that you could put to a computer? So this one, it said on it that you could put it to a computer. I, when I connected it, it was hard to do. And this one's Mm -hmm. older, but, uh, so this one has got, you've got, uh, eight inputs and it will record each of those eight inputs onto its own track. And then with with all your sliders and stuff like that, you can mix the tracks down. And then it's got a built-in, when CD was big, CD player. Right. And then you could export it onto a CD. This has got built-in mastering and everything. When I bought this, this thing was, I bought this a long, long time ago, and this thing was really expensive. Mm. Now you can find this exact thing, like on Kijiji or something for, I don't know, 500 or... right. Which is still that's still pretty good for, yeah, for something it, old. It, Not like it's going for like twenty five bucks or anything like that. No, but if you want, like, there are smaller ones too. But at the mm-hmm. time, we wanted as like we needed as many tracks uh, for recording as we could, and we were even cheating at the time. Like we had, I'm just gonna put that down here. We had uh, my brother playing a fully electronic kit. And the first album, like at, at the time we were recording it, we thought it sounded amazing, but a fully electronic kit sounds really fake in a recording. So that's when he started uh, building it into a hybrid kit so that you, when you're playing, you can hear some of the room in with the mix and things like that. So we've been learning as we go. And so I just have... Um, it can kind of be seen over there. It's pretty much this thing, but uh, newer. Mm -hmm. Uh, I can hold it up. Which is so something like that would be used to. Okay. Nice. Yeah. And then, so basically for people that are watching, like everything would go through there. And then I'm guessing that would go to your computer and then you would have uh, some software running that would record it or you could, I don't know if you'd use GarageBand or uh, Pro Studio or something like that, but that, I guess that could be an option. Um, that, that that is a pretty nifty high tech gadget there. Yeah. So th- so though that recorder, I don't know. This is an older webcam. It does that sometimes. Um, that recorder there is. Um, uh, it, it's pretty much that it can handle eight simultaneously. And it uh, records to an SD card. So you can take that out and you can just throw it in your computer and then you can uh, import all the tracks. I have used GarageBand a little bit, uh, but something like the track that I sent you guys with all the, um, with with all those instruments, we had a quartet. So there were uh, four four, uh, string members uh, yeah, the were, Raptors lose. That was uh, that was really cool. Oh, thanks. Yeah, the yeah. Mm-hmm. So there were four string members: me on bass, uh, Matt on guitar or on uh, synthesizer, and then my brother on drums. And he had a bunch of uh, drum uh, mics set up. And so with that, because GarageBand only allows you, I think it's sixteen tracks. We recorded it in two parts, and so we had all those tracks and then on the same song the ending where it comes back in we actually recorded that separate it isn't one flowing song uh and that so it would have been way too many so i actually do some recording on uh audacity uh no not audacity audition audition Audition. yeah yeah both are good audition a little bit more i prefer audition myself i use audition as well um, a lot of, so a lot of the stuff that you've done and, and to get into the radio Waterloo side of things, a lot, a lot of this maybe does mix into, um, a lot of the stuff that you've done and, and the musician you are, some of it has kind of tied into the passion of community radio. What's, what happened with, the uh, the connection with that and, and to this current day, what's, what's going on with that? Yeah, I, I think, um, after Cyanide Kiss kind of stopped playing, then I got into community radio, 
found out about all these uh, different bands and things like that, set up the audio comic. Uh, I think I just like being involved in, in something musical. So uh, we get an idea and then we start pursuing, seeing how we can put that together. And then the audio comic kind of facilitated the uh, robot apocalypse recording. Um, so then we started doing the robot apocalypse recording. And then um, just with the whole COVID and lockdown and stuff like that, as I was going, I was collecting all these like analog synthesizers, like this thing here, which is, cool. it, this one is a drum sequencer. Oh, wow. Uh, and so you program into it. I, I collected this a while ago and I've got like a, a couple analog synths and stuff over there. And it's just a lot of wires. You're playing with wires and buttons. And so you don't need to be like really good theory wise at music to play this stuff. Like it's, does that sound good? No, I'm going to push less of that button. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so, but I had never learned how to use it. But then with all the uh, lockdown stuff, I thought this is a good opportunity for me to, I'm stuck at home, not doing anything. I may as well connect all this stuff up. And then that's when I started recording all kind of my analog synth uh, type album, which is mainly instrumental, but there's a, a little bit of um, kind of sample talkings that I uh, intersperse in, in amongst it. So. So is that all weather haulage? Yeah, yeah. So that yeah, and, and that really cool. That that name I got uh, there. There's uh, the the book series, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. The um, the they call it the fifth book in the trilogy, but the or no, the mm -hmm. yeah, the fifth book in the something like that. I don't know. I think it's the fourth yeah. or fifth book is called uh, So Long and Thanks for All the Fish. And there's the chapter two of it starts out and it's the only chapter in the whole trilogy that this character is mentioned. Uh, his name is Rob McKenna and he has an all-weather haulage service. And, uh, and it just talks <laughs> about him for the one chapter and then he has no part in any of the storyline or <laughs> anything else. It, it, it's just in there for some reason. Cool. And so that's where I went with the name because uh, it had the exact same name as wow. me for some reason. Interesting. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Pretty cool origins of that. So you had you've had a show with CKMS for how long now? Uh, probably. So I, it's either it's about twelve years. I was twelve or thirteen years. I can't remember if if the station left in two thousand and uh eight or 2009 but mm -hmm. whatever year it left the bauer warehouse i started that year okay that's so cool that's a long time eh yeah 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 and it doesn't well, it doesn't feel like it really but like looking back all those moves like it it just seems like it just happens but yeah that it happens over time man <laughs> <clears throat> Should we listen to some of your music? Have we come to the point where we get to listen to what you've accomplished? So one, the uh, All Weather Haulage is basically you, Rob McKenna, and then Robot Apocalypse is collaborations with many different people and some constant band members. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The so the yeah uh, for for All Weather Haulage, it was uh, a bunch of people had left. I uh, and I didn't know really if I would have a band again. So I just wanted to still record and just even small scale. Like I, initially, there's another All Weather Haulage album on the Mono A Mono Bandcamp. And it's just like me playing with acoustic instruments. A lot of them that I got out of the garbage or free off Kijiji or things like that, just to try and put an album together with these instruments. And so I, I don't know, I, I just try things that I know if I brought a song with all these like rained out uh, instruments that sounded terrible to a robot apocalypse practice, 
I know that my brother and and Matt would be like, no, that sounds like junk. We're not using that. So the all weather haulage is kind of a, an experimentation thing where I can just kind of do stuff without someone saying, no, 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 that's, that doesn't sound good enough for this. So. Okay. Yeah. It was, well, there's uh... a tunes there. Mm hmm. I thought it was beautiful. I was in my kitchen and I just turned it on. You sent us to us just before we started this. And I was like, this is beautiful. I want a t-shirt. No. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you. And there's some cool music videos that you posted as well. Uh, I saw in the summertime of the all weather haulage um, music and you used a drone to record some of those. Uh, that That's pretty cool. Uh, I, I, I love that, uh, that side of things. Drones are cool. And you had some really good shots of the river there and, and uh, it really put you in a sense because it kind of feels like it's ambient music. So with that visual side of things, it uh, is very relaxing almost. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That was kind of the idea with that. I, I feel like it's just, it is almost like an ambient, just looking out at a nice, uh, a nice summer landscape or something mm -hmm. like that, which doesn't make for a great music video in, in, in it topping any charts or anything, but I don't know. I, it, that I guess isn't really a goal. It's more for experimentation. Right. It's still, still cool though. And so for people that are watching and listening, is there any links or uh, social media handles that you, you can plug right now that people can go to that we can direct people to? Um, I, so the main, one like if people went to uh, mam radio m a m r a d i o dot c a that on there I've kind of adapted uh, mono a mono radio into a little bit of a promotion uh, website for the different uh, recording things. So my brother did the same thing when when he was at home and we weren't he wasn't recording. He set up a, a little band uh, called uh, Audio Boffins. So, um, and then he gets me to master some of it and, and put it on that band camp. So there's audio boffins, there's old cyanide kiss on there. Um, he went and recorded an album in an old, um, like an old cottage in somewhere in Montreal or something. Uh, <laughs> uh and so that he's got another little group with his friends called uh, green tree frogs. And then it's got Robot Apocalypse and some All Weather Haulage on there as well. Okay, cool. And I think RadioWaterloo.ca also has, if you just search any one of those, basically, something, you'll, you'll probably get something that will come up. Probably, yeah. We, I, I play myself every so often, so I'm sure I put some stuff up there. Mm, too. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a, so uh, Facebook or Twitter, is there a, a place on social media that people can go like? Um, there is a Mono, robot Mono's page too as well. Yeah, there's a robot apocalypse Facebook page, and I think there's Instagram pages. Instagram, yeah, mm. I follow you guys there. Okay, yeah. so good places for people if they would like to follow. And um, also, you know, before we wrap this up here, just in the next minute or so, um, I'd like to thank Rob McKenna again. Um, we feel like we just barely scratched the surface, so I'm sure we'll have you on again down the road. Well, thanks for having me. This was fun showing mm -hmm. off all, all my gear here. I haven't done that in a while. Yeah, hopefully we could do a jam maybe down the road when things are obviously better and uh, a jam. But to, I want to understand the recording process myself, so to physically do it, to, to learn it and show it, and that'd be that'd be something cool like a Radio Waterloo jam. Yeah, I, I actually you saying that reminds me I should have been interviewing you guys for some of this because you guys are performing members of the Robot mm -hmm. Apocalypse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yes. so check that out on yeah, the internet. It's it's fun. up. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Yes, experimenting with music is awesome. Yeah, yeah, that and was inviting fun. members of the audience. Yeah, that was cool. It's a good. It yeah, was we'll pretty good. Yeah, we'll have to good. do one of those again. Yeah, that was super fun. All right, uh, thank you again, Rob. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you.